Volume 3 Chapter 17 Ainz awoke out of a sound slumber, the light was just barely peeking in through the window of his room in the created fortress, and immediately his heart began to race. Shiltir had her cheek resting on his chest, that was alarming enough. More than that, she was nude, covered only by the long white hair that hung down the length of her body. Her body wasn't as warm as the living, though she wasn't cold to the touch, she didn't breath, but her mouth moved, she snuggled closer in her sleep, one leg draped over his, appearing every inch the young girl on the cusp of womanhood that she was designed to be. The perfect deception to disguise the monster which lay within. He instinctively brought a hand up to his throat and felt around. No, she didn't take a bite. I am. Whole. Eins realized, and then he began to relax. Until he had to wonder, did she do anything else while I was asleep? The fact that she was naked posed a whole host of other problems. Perarancino just copied the entire contents of the FET wiki into her flavor text so. Nothing is off the table. Eins realized and grimaced behind his mask. Then the reality of having a naked girl in his arms hit home and all else was jettisoned, he couldn't look. He didn't look, not again, it was enough to know that she was there. He found he had no will to move, it's the worst kind of paralysis spell. The self-induced kind. He managed to mock himself and his virginal absurd innocence. How am I supposed to maintain the image of the supreme god they look up to, if I can't even move when one of them touches me? Or strips. Stripping is harder but still. No dignified overlord acts like a shut-in neat who has never seen non-pixelated boobs before. The light on the wall told him about the passing of time, it continued to rise upward with the steadily rising sun outside, and more than one signs had to ask himself, how long will I be like this? Shilti's arms and legs continued to rub and caress him through his robe as she slept, until finally she began to stir, her eyes fluttered open and she immediately knew. Master. You're awake she said succinctly and rolled over so that she was on top of him, she put her forehead down to his chest while she straddled him. You slept, master, she said. So you know? Eins asked, but it was rhetorical. I heard your heartbeat. It was beautiful. Shilti replied to him without raising her head. So you know? It was not a question, but a statement. She nodded without letting her forehead leave his chest. Say it. He gave the order with more iron than he really felt. You're living, my lord. Shilti replied to him with a tiny whisper of a voice. Do you know more than that? Eins asked. She shook her head, again without raising her forehead from his chest, her hands lay on either side of her head. I don't, master. Tell me, Shilti, does it matter what the answer is? What I am. Eins pressed her. It only matters that you're the one who stayed with us. Nothing else. That's what you are, master, that's what I care about. Shilti replied to him with the utmost urgency. I know you can't trust me. Why not? Eins asked with earnestness, bringing his arms up and putting his hands to her face, he forced her head back to look at him, and like a young girl caught with her hand in the cookie jar, she bit her lower lip, her fangs drawing out her own blood, her eyes welled up with bloody tears, and she confessed. I almost took a bite. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my lord. I didn't do it. But to even think of it. I had your neck so close, I wanted to taste you. I wanted to feel you. I lied to myself and almost had myself believing that is why you brought me here. She sniffled while tears of red ran down her cheeks, to even consider an assault on a supreme being leaves me worthy only of death. Only my life can atone for. She'll tear. Before you go on. Why are you naked? Eins asked trying increasingly hard to not get increasingly hard. I'm not a lolican. It's just the stimulation, just the waking up, that's all. I almost did something terrible to the last supreme being, I don't deserve to wear the gifts of one. Also, in case my lord wished to use his newfound endowments, I would not waste a moment of his precious time. She did manage a little tiny smile with her sniffle at the latter part of her answer at least. Get dressed, she'll tear. Eins gave the order, and though she pouted, she climbed off of him, setting bare feet on the floor, she walked to her dress and began to put it on again. The rustling fabric was the only sound in the room. She stepped into her dress and pulled it up, sliding one slender arm through a sleeve, then another, she'll tear then reached behind herself to begin lacing it up. No. Eins gave the polite instruction to her with the crispness of a parent, and her deft little hands froze. 
He took the laces in his fingers, and gently pulled them out of her own until they lay limp in his hands. Then, in a silent gesture of affection, Eins began to lace her up himself. He didn't say anything as he drew a lace through each little loop, tightening it up a little more every time while Shiltir hung beyond the breathlessness of the undead. Her red eyes like twin blood moons opened wide to stare down at the new world below. If only my heart could beat like his, then I could show how wonderful this feels. To have the supreme being who stayed with them to the end show her this affection after her sin. It burned, it ached, it made her heart burst into flames of excitement as much as it turned to ash at the contemplation of what her nature had nearly compelled her to do. And he doesn't blame me. She realized, that was the worst part, his forgiveness of her imperfection, as if a failure was expected. She wiped away her bloody tears and cast them down to stain the grey stones of the created fortress to leave a mystery that would never be answered by those who would visit it after them. Finally her lord was done, he secured her final lace and gave it a sharp tug before securing it with deft and powerful fingers into a tiny little bow. There, Ein said, and took her shoulders, she turned around and found that he crouched down so that they were at eye level, though she couldn't see beyond his mask. And may this unworthy one beg to see her lord's face? Shiltir asked, I know it's improper after my sin. A reward like that. Even the maids outdid me. I'm sure Lupus Regina didn't even consider what I did. But still. Shiltir brought her hands up to close one open palm over a little fist before folding her fingers down in entreaty, please. The words Eins had been mentally preparing died in his throat. His own heart ached for her as a parent would for a beloved child who was frightened of that parent's wrath. She is a true vampire, it's only natural she would ache for human blood. But I brought her out here for this purpose, so that we would be alone and I could know where she stands. There's no backing down now. He thought and nodded. If your loyalty is to me, no matter what, you may remove it. Her little hands dropped to her sides, her head bowed, she slowly brought her hands up again, without raising her head. She stared only at the stone and his bent knees that lay behind his dark robe. She felt the magic mask with her tiny fingers and folded them behind it, then with the greatest reverence, Shiltir pulled it away. She held it down at waist height, beneath her eyes, moving her fingers over it with reverence, you weren't sure of us, were you, my lord? Ein's blood froze for a moment, but he couldn't bring himself to lie. Nor however, could he bear to tell her the full truth. I couldn't know so I thought it best to reveal this in secret, one by one, in case I had to flee. Eins answered, and the words were so unexpected that her face shot up to look at his own. Human, she said with a tiny whisper and reached out to touch his cheek, she stopped, realizing the presumptuousness, but he caught her hand in his and brought it up to press to the warmth of his flesh. Yes, Shiltier. Yes, he answered. H. How? She had to ask. The theocracy weapon it was unexpected. I seem to be storing my undead levels in my phylactery, which seems to have merged with me. I can still feel it, still access my magic as I always have. If anything I've grown vastly stronger than ever before, but I am. He patted the dainty hand of hers that rested on his cheek, this. His prior words then came back to her, and my lord why would you ever flee? You're easily more powerful than any of us. Because, my precious Shiltier, I could never hurt the children of my friends. Never. If even one of you was unwilling to serve me, I would rather leave Nazarick than do any of you any harm. So, beginning with Lupus Regina who realized it first, I carried on, Ein said in a delicate whisper only a little distance from the pale cheeks that were still stained with streaks of red from her earlier bloody tears. My lord, if anyone refused then the rest of us. She began but he stopped her immediately. No. Eins vigorously shook his head, I could never watch my friend's children kill each other. To see even one of you die would break my heart. So that is why we come out alone, in case the one who stayed. Goes. Shiltir shuddered at the idea. Yes. Eins replied. If ever our lord goes. If even one of us will not have you. I go too. The one who stayed will never go alone. If my lord will have this untrustworthy sinner. Shiltir's lip trembled. Blood drops began to pool at the corners of her eyes as tears threatened to fall again. My Shiltier, Eins replied, and he squeezed her, and squeezed her, and squeezed her, until at last he was ready to go. Volume 3 Chapter 18 The fire flared up almost instantly. The buried string as it turned out was secured to three pots of burning fish oil. 
These pots in turn led to trails of oily rags and other scattered flammable materials that formed a kind of bridge to the stink of the village interior. With their reserves of oil all churned up into the ground, the whole place went up in a blaze. Fire all toward the sky and the entire body of Frogman, including Hikati, sprang for safety. She dropped the lizard man, leaving him to die screaming in the flames beneath her. From the air she could still feel the heat chasing after her, threatening to scorch her people's flesh. Down below were a few who moved just a little bit too slowly. Their legs aflame or worse, those few who hadn't moved fast enough even for that harm to be avoided. A handful roasted alive in the flames left to her by the lizardman, their screams indistinguishable from those of the lizardman elder. She could see them rolling about, or fleeing, one made it out, rushing through the flames to seek the safety of the waters. Before she or the rest of her people landed outside the village, the lone runner reached the water and jumped inside in a futile search to save the life he's already lost. The yellow and orange glow didn't fade away, he'd rolled in oil that was now stuck to him, his head, still alight while boils rose from the heat and exploded, adding suffering to agony for the dying, his great white eyes were melted away to nothing, but the screaming stopped when the burning oil hit his tongue, lit it aflame, and burned it away. He lived a precious few seconds after that, by which time the queen had landed with a splash in the waters. The frogman corpse began to float silently in the water, little ripples still coming away from the place where his desperate splashes died with his life. Other frogmen were still shouting as they extinguished the flames on their comrades, burning their own hands to ease the pain of their brethren. He Ketty however, lumbered around to look at the horrific flames that still leapt higher than the walls. Perhaps it won't be so easy. That old one knew he was going to die, he knew it, and yet he threw his life away without hesitation or even fear. He died screaming, that was a relief at least. They feel pain, and they can be made to run. But I had hoped to catch them off of their guard. It's no matter. With our renewed numbers the brave will just die standing. Despite her attempts at reassuring herself, he Ketty felt the throbbing of her vocal sac, her eyes locked on the flames, her whole body instinctively craving to recoil from them. It kept her tense, unmoving, and it had the same effect on the rest of her raiding party. The understanding of the lizardman's do or die attitude was not lost on any of them. Reality was hitting home. She could feel the shift in her people. Their arrogance burned away in the flames. Maybe it's for the best if we don't underestimate them, they lasted as long as they did for a reason. He Ketty thought, and that settled her mind far more. She gave her order without her eyes leaving the fire. Wait until it dies down, when it does we are going to go through the remains, see if anything of value is left, then we will move south. We won't chase them right away? One of her subordinates inquired. No. No we won't, we'll let them weaken themselves. Let them run, we'll follow after the fires and let them feast on mud if they want. Or cannibalize each other, you remember what the witness said. They'll eat each other if they get hungry enough, every full belly will weaken them more and then we'll finish off the rest. He Ketty promised. The vision of her dream returned to her again, the great lake and the swamp around it, great villages of her own civilization rising up. Frogman merchants spreading out, dominating the great waters, hunting down the few monsters that were a threat, forcing the empire to acknowledge her as queen, and her land as a queendom all its own. No more pesky humans skirting around the borders, no more threats, and we could reign supreme forever here. The glorious vision of the great homes she would build along the waters, an imitation of those built by humans at first, but with their own flair, adapted to the environment of her domain. It will be beautiful, glorious, wonderful beyond words. And all I need to do is clean out the pests. He Ketty thought, and watched as the flames roared on before her. They were late leaving the improvised fortress, and outside their door, a nervous lizardman paced back and forth. Shaja Ryu's entire body was on pins and needles while he waited for their potential savior to emerge from the room with his concubine. I don't care that he's a lolican. As long as he saves us. But what if he's a pervert who wants our women too? Should I ask? Can I even ask, do I risk offending him? No, best not to, from what my brother says, it's only her type that are appealing to men like that. Wait, is he even human? I haven't seen his face, I just assumed but I haven't seen a human in years. Shajirio's mind was racing like a gale force wind with every minute that passed. Make it casual, make it calm and peaceful, make it seem like you don't care, who knows, maybe it's normal for them. 
Shajiryu tried to tell himself that, but he had his doubts. What good does it do to save us from the frogmen if we find a fate worse than death for ourselves afterward? Shajiryu asked the vital question and with the time elapsed from his most desperate personal hour to the present, the once distant uncertainty loomed like a mountain before his eyes. As soon as the powerful magic caster emerged, with the young vampire girl clinging tightly to his arm as they exited the building, the lizard man went down to one knee and bowed his head, My lord, will you forgive me one small request? A request? That is unexpected. Anz mused and inclined his head. Go ahead. My lord. While your humble servant would never dream to criticize your pleasures. Shajriu's words caused Ainz to begin to blush beneath the mask, the sooner we reach my village the better. So while I wouldn't dare to challenge your desires for your beautiful concubine, could this humble one beg your indulgence and ask that those pleasures be only slightly delayed? Shultia, at first baring her fangs in fury, shaking with wrath, quickly turned about in her mood when she was referred to as her master's lover. She clung more tightly to the arm she held and beamed up at him. He's suggesting that his village would be a better place for Lord Irons to lay claim to me. Of course, of course, long tedious walks in the swamp are not going to inspire desire in anyone anyway. But a lakeside view with lots of servants, however inadequate they may be, that is different. Concubine? Irons mentally recoiled, I'm not a lolican. All right, so yes, Shiltir is beautiful but, still, I'm not that way. Now if she had a more adult body and a chest like Albedo's. He glanced down at the diminutive little vampire and seeing the eager way she looked up at him, and feeling the pressure as her powerful arms tightened around his own, he could only be grateful for his mask when he answered. Of course, we must hurry, but Shiltir is not my concubine, she is the child of one of my dearest friends, one of those I stayed behind to protect. Now, lead on, Shajariu, Ainz commanded, and the lizard man rose to his feet turned around, and led Irons back into the swamp again. Volume 3 Chapter 19 The rest of the journey to the village of the Green Claw tribe belonging to Shajiryu Sasha was uneventful, and by Irons reckoning it could even be called pleasant. The air was muggy and full of insects, but the flowering plants, and the great trees that created a constant shade under which to walk, it was enchanting. Blue Planet. If you could see this, you would die of happiness. It was enough to put him in an excellent mood. His natural curiosity prompted him to pepper their guide with questions. How many kinds of plants do you have? What kind of animal life lives here? Do you have any rare monsters not found elsewhere? Several questions were prompted by a kind of fatherly instinct. I should bring Aura and Mare a present for when I get back. Shajiryu developed a spring in his step during that walk back. He seems truly fascinated, enthralled even. Could he really see this as the wonder that I do? It was a hopeful thought, the eager, even youthful voice of the caster seemed so energetic, deep, rich and flowing like the endless wine of one of their great treasures. The lizard man chief found something quite unexpected about the passionate commander of the little vampire monster. It was hard not to like him. Like some divine glow came off which illuminated even the dark cast by the shadowy canopy. The questions asked of him only made the lizard man chief happier. His feet picked up and tail lashed up and down with contentment, yes, my lord, our villages are very small, there are only about two thousand of us or so. Why so few? Ainz inquired, his collector's curiosity adding value and caution alike to the lizardmen before him. Monsters are many in the deep swamp, and within the lake as well, both can kill the unwary. Besides that, we have sometimes suffered from hunger, and war has sometimes come between our villages. We once had more than twice the numbers we did, but not anymore. Shajriu's voice became heavy, the spring left his step. Oh, perhaps I should not ask more. It would be insensitive of me to open an old wound. Ainz answered. Shajriu shook his head. I'm offering my tribe to you, you should know. We had years of good harvests, all of us. There was no hunger. Then we had bad harvests. We caught some fish, and what we did catch was too few. So then there was hunger, we fell fighting each other, and half of us died. The problem of hunger solved itself. Now there is no hunger again. His fists clenched tight at his sides while Ainz remained silent at his back. You must think us a race of fools, my lord. Shajariu finally filled the gap of words. So that happens even here. Ainz thought as he reflected on all the stories of hunger and deprivation. Thinking of his historian friend. That's right. 
He told me about that once, how people would farm until they wore out the soil, their numbers growing large, fighting over the remaining food, then going somewhere else to start the cycle over. It sent a shudder down his spine to imagine such desperation. No. 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 He told himself, perhaps that's something I can prevent. But there was no perhaps about it. With the knowledge in the library of Asher Bonapol at his disposal, he could pass all the knowledge of ecology they could ever want to the lizardman under his rule. Pity however, moved him to speak. No. No you're not, Shadaryu. Eins told him, and the lizardman stopped and turned around to face his master. My lord? He asked the tall caster, his long face turned up toward the red and white mask. I've seen it happen before, on another world that destroyed itself, or nearly. Those vicious cycles happen when the knowledge of ecological management is absent. You offer me your people, and if your offer holds, then I will help you, Ayn said matter-of-factly. Shazriu's heart sang out with happiness, who knows what bottomless well of knowledge lies in this one. His mind spun with the idea of there being other worlds but the very idea was so large, so overwhelming, and also so irrelevant that he all but threw it away in the face of the promise of salvation for his people. His immediate need, all else came second. So it was in that positive spirit of restored optimism that Shajariu and his charges reached the edge of the path over which he guided them, and before emerging, he stopped. Please, wait here. This will be a surprise for them and I want a chance to explain so they understand. I'm sure by now, if my brethren survived, they will be nearly certain that I've died. Shiltir looked up into the eyes of the lizardman, her bright scarlet red was intoxicating, so easy to be lost in, even for him. If you lie to us, lizardman, if you betray my master, you will beg for death for ten thousand years. I do not lie. Shajriu replied with a steady shake of his head, you and he saved my life. I am an honorable warrior, my word is my bond. That seemed to placate her, but when Eins gave an approving nod, the little vampire still stepped in front of him, ready to shield his body with her own as his bodyguard. Her dress vanished, and in its place was a girl in scarlet red armor and replacing her parasol was a long lance with a bulb-like guard just beyond the wrist. Go, lizard man, and prove your loyalty. Shiltir commanded him, and he turned around, took a deep breath, and emerged into view. The village is intact at least. That means they haven't turned on each other. That thought made him give a double sigh of relief, and more importantly he noticed that the earthenworks had been expanded, lizardman youths were carrying buckets of earth into place to add new low walls from which to defend. The sound of shouting elders giving directions and grousing youths became louder and louder as he came closer to home until he was observed recognizing him must have taken a moment, but the young on the walls keeping a watchful eye were quick to raise the hue and cry, immediately the entire village was soon a beehive of wild activity. You're alive? How? One of the elders shouted in a raspy, broken old voice that hadn't been raised in years. His stooped body was near broken by time, but he hid the ghost of his old strength in his cracked old green scales when he put his hands on Shajariu's shoulders and asked his question. I was rescued, Shajariu shouted, then lowered his voice as his tribe and the red eyes came in to hear the story. I encountered a mighty being, who by his grace, had his servant save my life, he has power beyond our ability to even describe it. He can stop the frogman, I have offered my tribe in fealty if he would only grant my tribe life as he granted it to me. This set them all to many murmurs of doubt and uncertainty. The tight grip of the oldster who held his shoulders faded. But before anyone could raise a doubt or ask a question, the Green Claw Chieftain spoke up again. I've come in first so as not to alarm you, but if you're ready, I'll bring our savior in so that you may see him and his servant for yourselves. Shajriu's voice was full of supreme eagerness, but nobody made to move out of his way. Whatever they were expecting him to say when he came into the bustling village, that hadn't been it. Shajriu carried on when they didn't make way. He says he can end the struggle for food that nearly ruined us, and stop the frogman attack, I have seen his power with my own two eyes, you must believe me. Let me go bring him in, and see if you can doubt it. Many a lizardman's head turned back and forth, male and female, young and old, were asking in silence what should be done. With no one proffering ideas, Shajriu took the first step from the center of the little mob himself, and at that they moved aside. He could feel them watching eyes of the outsiders and of the green claw, fearful, hopeful, desperate, 
The sea of emotions that beset their small and nearly hopeless band warned him that they had not liked what they learned after his diversion. But there was no chance to ask, he had to move with the ebb and flow of the battle of words, and bring their saviour inside to set their souls on fire, as his own had been before.